A Thousand and One Night is a collection of fairy tales. They often start with Once Upon a Time. So does the tale of Shahrazada. Once upon a time, in a land far from here, there was a king who was deceived by his wife. He was devastated, sad and angry. This should never happen again. So he decided every day to marry a new wife and put her to death in the morning. Until one day he married Shahrazada. To avoid that she would be killed after the wedding night, she told the king a story that wasn't finished by morning. The king was curious, so he spared her. That night, she went on with the story. But again, in the morning, it wasn't finished. He rewarded her another night. A thousand and one full nights, Shahrazada told him a story, and every night ended with an unfinished story. After that thousand and one night, he loved her so much that he decided not to kill her. And they lived happily ever after. I am a forensic detective in the cold case team of Amsterdam, and I have a thousand and one unfinished stories for you. A thousand and one cold cases, unsolved crimes, murder, manslaughter, serious sexual offenses, manslaughter, I told you. Cold case capture the imagination. There are cases that for years keep the attention of the public. When we solve an old crime, it's widely reported in the media. There are TV series in which high-heeled detectives retrieve a case of 30 years old. And it's all in one box. The complete case files, all the photos, forensic evidence, all in pristine condition. They solve the case in 50 minutes. That is not the reality where I have to deal with. Cold case investigation is like a time travel, and in that way, a journey of discovery. What was the situation back in the 90s, for example? How did we organize the files? Where are the original photos? And what about forensic evidence? Where is it? And in what condition? What techniques were available, and did we all use them? In that way, cold cases are not divided in determined in diversity in the manner of which someone is killed. It's mostly stabbing, shooting, strangulation. It's the time when it happened that divides the diversity. In that way, we um, organize the cases in possibilities, the forensic poss possibilities. Cold cases we investigate start from 1988, because from that moment, there was no statute of limitations on murder. There are many cases, too many. Imagine a large cabinet where all the case files are, and it's about a thousand, only for the city of Amsterdam. A thousand files are stored in that cabinet, and each of the files has a number. But behind each number, there's a man's life, a story that is unfinished. We didn't solve the case. No justice has been done. So a thousand files in that imaginary cabinet. And there they are, a thousand files. They are stored in that cabinet. And stored has different meanings. Stored also means maintained, preserved, as well as hidden. And that is what I see in an imaginary closet in front of me. A thousand files are stored, waiting for me to pull out one of them, which means that 999 others remain stout. And I can almost hear them sigh in disappointment, because we have to choose, choose who we give attention, who we give time, if only for a few hours a day. Many of these files have a picture of the victim on the back of the file. I feel a connection with them, I know their faces, though we never met. 
There are the faces of young people, old people, dark, blonde, alive. But also the faces of the death, snatched from alive where the story is unfinished. And in my mind, I traveled to the time when they were killed, in the 80s, 90s, in the years just after the millennium. And I see the possibilities, but also the impossibilities. There's one group, one special group of cold cases. For example, this case. In 1997, somewhere in the waters of Amsterdam, a trash bin was found, which contained the body of a young woman. And this is her story. Perhaps you think that I lost my lines, that I don't remember what story to tell you. That's partly true. There is no story. We don't know who she is. This woman has no name, no identity. She is an unknown death, or as we call it, a nomen nisio. She's buried in a grave with a number and without a name. Grave number A126 on depth three. Who was she? What has made her ending? in a trash bin, with bullets in her head and bullets in her chest, somewhere in Amsterdam. Who was she? Who misses her? Because somewhere in the world, someone has to wait for her. Who are her parents? Did she have brothers and sisters? But first and foremost, who killed her? To find out as much as possible about her, we decided to excavate her remains. We deployed all the techniques of the present. We know now that she was small, about my height. She had dark brown, almost black hair. She was young, beyond 28. Her DNA sample is plotted worldwide, hoping to match with somebody who's missing. Her fingerprints are in all available databases. Isotope research showed that she grew up in the Netherlands. We know what caliber weapon she was shot, but her name, until now, we don't know. While we were working on this case, it became evident that she was not the only unknown death. When the administrator of the cemetery asked me when we would be back to excavate the others, at my astonished look, he, de he declared that he had at least 40 more unknown deaths on his cemetery. So we did some research, and we found that there were even a greater number. Almost 100 unknown deaths have been buried in Amsterdam since the 1980s. Most of the graves have already been cleared, as is normal in Amsterdam after 10 years. Only a small number of the graves were still there. Those numbers intrigue me. How is it possible that in, in the Netherlands, where everything is arranged to the detail, where it is unthinkable that you go through life without an identity, you apparently can be buried without a name, without an identity, and remain nameless forever? So I researched the new forensic techniques that, were possible, that made it possible to identify them. So a new timeline was created, a new forensic timeline of the unknown death. And it showed that there were a lot of unemployed possibilities and new techniques. So I started lobbying to make, uh, make it possible to work on it. My superiors were not happy about my ideas. The expected uh, objections were there. No staff resources available, no money, no time but also who would be interested in these issues? Is that a task for law enforcement? So I ask all of them, what about you? Imagine someone you love very dearly and he will disappear one day. And you were searching day after day, week after week, year after year. And you would know there would be a possibility to find your loved one, but they don't do it because of the reasons you just told me. So, of course, we did start. 
and we had the ambition that if it was only possible to identify one of the unknown death, it would be worth all the effort. Because every human being has the right to a name, to a history that can be told up to the end. That goal is more than achieved. So far, we have been able to identify 32 unknown deaths. 32 people have a name, have a history, which can be told again. <laughs> Thank you. Um, these 32 people came from all over the world. They had several histories. Some of them were killed. Some of them committed suicide. Some of them died of overdose. Some of them drowned somewhere in the waters of Amsterdam. Some of them died of natural causes. They were young, average under 35. But they all had one thing in common. They all had loved ones who were looking for them, searching for them, waiting. And they all had an unfinished story and especially in case of a homicide, we were able to start to investigate the, as a cold case, try to find the perpetrator and bring justice. Amsterdam is not the only place where there are many cold cases. Out through the Netherlands, we are facing several thousand cases. That is a cabinet so full of case files where we could work on for a lifetime with hundreds of colleagues. Most of these files also have a name of the victim. That means that they have a voice. They have family, they have relatives who can speak up for them. Ask the attention of the police, of the Justice Department, the media. They have a voice. But what about the unknown death? We don't know how many there are. It's estimated there are two to three hundred in the Netherlands. Again, I call numbers, two to three hundred. How disrespectful we make the lives of these people. They don't have a name, no history. They don't have a voice. They are just one of a thousand and one. But let me be the voice, at least for one of them tonight, for you. Let me tell you the story of No Manesio, number 47. It's the life, the, the story of the death and life of a young man. A young man who was found in Amsterdam. His body was dumped in the grove. And when we investigated him, we found that a number of the 70 packages of cocaine he swallowed opened in his stomach. Each package contains 10 grams of cocaine. Nobody will survive that. He had no identity papers on him. His fingerprints yielded no hits. His face on TV, no comment. So after a few weeks, the investigation stopped, and he was buried in a, in a nameless grave with a number, A126, on depth 3. But 10 years after his death, we were able to identify him. His name is Raphael, and he was 19 years young. He came from a small town in Brazil, where his father owns a modest shop. And Rafael worked every now and then in the local liquor store. There he was approached by a member of a drug cartel. And he made him an offer to seemingly easy earn a lot of money. His dream, having his own shop, seemed to come true. This was an offer he couldn't refuse. He told his parents that he would travel to Amsterdam to work in a pizza restaurant for a month, and then he would be back. But Rafael didn't come back. Instead of baking pizzas, he had to swallow cocaine bulbs. His parents waited and waited, and went to the local police. But they were not very reluctant to look for a young man who traveled to Amsterdam. Finally, they, went, they uh, asked the Brazilian embassy in the Netherlands for help. And they placed a call on their site which only years later attracted our attention. Then we were able to connect this missing young man with the unknown young man that we found 10 years before. 
After his identification, some members of the drug cartel were arrested in Brazil. They are held responsible for a great number of drug-related crimes, including the death of the mule, Rafael. That is how they are called, mules, the men and women who risk their lives hoping for a better future. <clears throat> the remains of Rafael are sent back to his family in Brazil, and in a way he's connected with them. Ten years working as a... As a, a I don't even know my own profession anymore. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, ten years working in cold cases in Amsterdam, the great number of files didn't discourage me. They made me determined to do whatever we can, to use every technique and to keep drawing the attention. Because we must find the stories of these people. Cold case investigation is about people with an unfinished story. You need that story to solve the crime. But it's also connecting professionally with your victim. Try to get to know him or her, to find the connection to the perpetrator and bring justice. But it's also connecting death to life for those who stay behind. Because they may have lost their loved one, but they shouldn't uh, lose connection with their common history. And I, actually, I would like to say to you, young people here, students, traveling all over the world, in a seemingly very connected world, stay connected with your loved ones. It's more precious and valuable than you probably realize. I told you about the timelines, the forensic timelines with the possibilities. And when I look at them, I can tell you exactly where the new possibilities are. What new DNA techniques we can use. What new DNA samples can be retrieved. What new legal opportunities we have. But there are two words that are not written on those timelines and are crucial. Two crucial words, and they are get started. Get started with all those files, with all those unfinished stories those unsolved crimes. Sometimes solving a crime starts with something as taken for, for granted as a name. So to my fellow detectives out in the country and in the world, I would like to ask, be Sharazade. Make sure that the stories are being told, that the cases are not closed and forgotten. I would like to ask them, be the voice of that one of a thousand and one. Thank you.